Okay, welcome to this special episode of Kung Fu Explained. It's an addendum episode to the hidden history of Shui Jiao. I'm here with my good friend, Emmanuel Papa. Hello. He's a Shui Jiao and actually Bok practitioner as well, a wrestler of uh, many types. And um, we've had him on the podcast as well as um, in discussion with talking specifically about uh, Shui Jiao history. Um, that was part of his research. So... There's an interesting video that he's <laughs> brought to my attention that uh, we're going to be presenting in here, which is very interesting, and it's by uh, it's a little interview with Li Baoru. Who is Li Baoru? Uh, Li Baoru is one of the like probably most important figures for uh, Chinese wrestling of the for the past thirty years. I would say he was before the coach for the national team, Chinese national team for Chinese wrestling, and is probably one of the most uh, important researcher. Uh, for Chinese wrestling. He studied under many teachers, uh, researching specifically Chinese wrestling. Mm -hmm. How old is he? Right now, I think this here is going to turn 90. No, he's over 90, I think. Over 90 already? Uh, yeah, I think he's over 90. Anyway. Pretty, he's, pretty old. So he's one of the older generations. So he got, he's kind of a link between the early days of, yeah. of Shui Zhao and today. And he's also a central figure as a wrestler and researcher. Now, this interview is not very long. But the things that he says in it tie a lot of facts together um, that are pretty important with regards to the history of Shui Jiao, where it comes from, its culture, um, how it used to be practiced, and many other interesting aspects. You know, the, one of the reasons why um, this has to be done and this video is being, being produced is, you know, a lot of researchers and people, including myself, that have done and made some presentations with evidence, etc., still running into a lot of resistance, let's call it. Yeah. But the people are retarded. In light of evidence being presented, and, and you know, evidence, it doesn't have an emotion, and it also doesn't have a cultural leaning in the sense that it favors something or it doesn't favor something. And unfortunately, a lot of the resistance we get is that. So, um, the facts of the matter need to be rather introduced from the horse's mouth. And yeah. a lot of the people, irrespective of their leanings, understand that Li Baoru, as a Shui Jiao figure, yeah. and of somebody of importance with the history and the knowledge, if it's coming from him, well, it's coming from the horse's mouth. Yeah. So what we're going to do in this video is I'm going to play this uh, video. We're going to stop it at points and just uh, further extrapolate and articulate on certain things that are being said. So we'll get started with the video. Then. Awesome. Yellow 那我们现在过去呢，就老年间上也有那个，啊，他是弄一个那个绸子，系上。So uh, the first thing he's talking about is actually the janga. He does yeah. say the upper jacket, but he's talking about the janga specifically. Or what is a janga? Well, a janga is uh, what you most often see a Mongolian wrestler from Inner Mongolia wear right now. Uh, it's like a series of cloth that are tied together into this like uh, circular circular shape that they wear around their neck. Uh, not everybody, as mm -hmm. he was explaining, can wear janga. Yeah. And um, all the, the means, the way you uh, get one uh, changed through times. Uh, right now, so in my last uh, one of my recent trip uh, yeah. to Inner Mongolia, I got the chance to um, meet up with like a professor and uh, an old ex wrestlers wrestler uh, which is also a very famous uh, author of books about uh, book mm. and I was asking him about you know, Mongolian wrestling about Mongolia yeah. yeah of course about Mo Mongolian yeah. wrestling and I was asking him when specifically this started the janga, and the, janga the, the practice of yeah. wearing a janga and if it changed through times and he was saying yeah like in the last 40 50 years uh, when they uh, made, made like um, 
like a systematized uh, Mongolian wrestling. Like standardization. It's standardized. Yeah, standardized Mongolian wrestling more. Uh, there's specific criteria that you need to meet. So winning a certain amount of like tournaments uh, with a certain amount of like, uh, like people that participate in the tournament uh, at a certain amount of times. And right now it's like very fixed. Uh, every time you participate to a tournament, you need to write down where, uh, how many people, what like, uh, what was your position at the end? Like, do you got like first place or second place or fourth place? And back in the days, it was it's not like that. It wasn't standardized based on those kind of criteria. Not at all, because yeah. there was not like a, a specific uh, singular, let's say, entity or like groups of people that were like uh, dealing with like a book. It was more. Uh, depending on whether you participated to tournaments or like uh, Nadams where they were or like temples or who um, decided to, you know, plan the tournament. And most of the times, as he was explaining, uh, wrestlers with like a good result would start wearing uh, a rope around their neck for like depending on the people that they won. And then this rope like became more and more. Yeah. And so they keep tying things. Yeah, keep tying things. And uh, in old pictures, we can see that the zanga they were wearing back in the days is, is pretty different from what yeah. we see uh, today. And not it's like in a bad way. It's just like different. What we see today is like thicker, generally thicker around and the it's neck. It's more solid too. It's more solid. Um, and back in the days, it was very thin. You could literally see there was like ropes tying to like tied together to either like a circular rope or just tying them together. Some of them even have like just one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they added others. And back then, it was very much related with their like beliefs. Yeah. Uh, because the colors had a specific meanings. Yeah. And um, and it was always related to the place that they earned the janga, either like temples or monks that like were giving Give those jankas. Them, yeah. Because the ties of wrestling with the religious component of Mongolian culture was, were pretty deep. Yeah. And they still are, I believe. Well, that's uh, interesting that you say that because I remember years ago. Now, I mean, I've been training and, you know, living in China and coming to China for more than two decades. But I remember because one of my interest hobbies was about Tibetan Buddhism, right? And we know that the Mongolians converted to Tibetan Buddhism. Um, they still had some of their underlying shamanistic belief, but they're Tibetan Buddhists. If you go to Tibetan Buddhist uh, temples, you'll always see those flags that they would hang up and they're yeah. all different colors. And then I remember the first time I saw a Janga, I was like, that looks like uh, the strips of cloth, because you can buy them too. And they're, yeah. they're, they're supposed to be for good luck. So you buy these knots of material. I mean, I have some hanging on my cupboards here. Um, and they're, they've got religious, but they've also got like uh, folk belief kind of things and the colors, and it looks like a Janga actually. In fact, this over here, which is, uh, it's called a Hada. A uh, Hada, they're called Hada. Yeah. And it's, I, I always thought this has to be connected to the ideas of Hada, which is connected to honor, it's connected to religion and folk belief, because they put it around your neck. Yeah. And Hadas of different colors, and it's, it's, you can see if like, for example, Lamas go somewhere special, they greet them with Hadas, they put this thing around their neck. So the connection to the religion and the folk always made sense to me. I mean, the 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 the, the janga is is made of hada. Yeah, you exactly. You have them. You wear hada and then you tie them together. Back then, he said he was used to be like that. Like you won one and then you tie, tie it and another, then you keep tying. Another, that makes sense. And then you have like today. What is today is more like, uh, it's done like more precisely. It's yeah. nicer, but that's that's the idea. And the colors are the same colors. They are present and important for like uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah, yeah. Like the colors are not random. Back, back in the day, certain colors used to be uh, able to be worn only by certain like uh, wrestlers, like white and blue, especially white, where like higher up, like yeah. uh, older or like more uh, skilled wrestler could wear them, uh, whether like younger wrestler could only wear like red, yellow, yeah, some okay. green, Makes sense. and then back in the days. And I think still recently, not everybody is allowed to wear white on their janga. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I have re I don't very think rarely. I've, I've seen white on a janga before. Very rarely. Yeah. Some some have them, and uh, it's only because it's the purest color yeah. for in the Mongolian culture, or it's really important, so you can't just randomly wear it. And I think a very interesting anecdotes to to tell uh, our, our friends is this anecdote that like our friend Lavelle, hi Lavelle, <laughs> hi Lavelle, uh, <laughs> uh, told me one time related to you know the connection between uh, still Mongolian book and religion. And he had this friend 
friend that was like not doing really well recently in uh, some nadams and he decided to go back to his like uh, small village into that it had like his, its grassland. Own, yeah, grassland and it, it, it had like its own obo and to stay there and like you know connect more with nature for a couple of days and because he felt he needed to do that, he came back and just killed everybody <laughs> after. <laughs> well, you know, this can be whatever. But it's like, like a somatic, but it's got value. This yeah, is, I mean, the, the value is, is in the fact that he believed that going back to where he is from and doing certain things to connect him with nature would allow him to have a better wrestling. Okay. Which is, yeah, this is what, we, what, what is yeah, important. Exactly. It's not just... Uh, Let's a say rank a sport. Yeah. A rank is or not a just a sport. Yeah. Well, it's... what's interesting about what he's saying here is, and how it's connected to what we're talking about in, in the Shui Jiao sense, is that he's saying that in the older times, the Shui Jiao wrestlers would also have a type of a Janga yeah. on, on their neck, and they don't have it anymore. But they don't have it and anymore. And here it is from the horse's mouth. So if there's no clearer connection, yeah, in I, one sense, then I don't know what more you need, right? So yeah, I I, w I would say you know you cannot trust us, and uh, you can have your own opinions. But in the end, if you go to China, you want to learn Shui Jiao, <laughs> you, Shui Jiao, you, you go to him <laughs> probably. To and uh, I I don't know, like uh, you can disagree with me. It's harder to disagree with him. It's not like a really easy character to uh, to tame, let's say. Yeah. And he mentions the boots as well, that the yeah. early shampoo Ying was wearing boots and yeah. the early time wrestlers had only changed to cloth material in subsequent time. Later on, yeah. It's one of the ways of uh, calling the wrestlers from the shampoo Ying was also to call them Guan Tui Zi. Uh, Guan Tui Zi means, or Guan is like uh, the palace. Mm -hmm. uh, Tui's leg, Tui Zi was actually meant to mean boots. A boot. And... Why Guan Tui Zi this mean uh, this 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 word could describe the wrestler because only if you were rank, higher rank you could get those kind of boots. So if you were walking around with boots, you're, you're a wrestler. Yeah, you're a wrestler, yeah. or you're a higher rank. Yeah. You're just not walking around with those with those kind of like uh, boots randomly. Yeah. So boots are definitely a factor, and it's interesting to note how the boots. Uh, changed with the wrestling when when the wrestling was outside before when they say Ru Guan before like the Qing conquest uh, were mainly of leather and then when they uh, you know Manchus conquered Beijing and entered the palace and then the wrestling started to develop inside palace more they became made of cloth because that was was used in the city mm -hmm. more rather than in, in the in the grassland because in the grassland you need leather here you don't really need leather in yeah. the city so the change you see in from not just from like where they were coming from, where they were practicing, but also, you know, with, with history and how like the, the practice environment and the practice developed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's carry on. Let's carry on. <laughs> Okay, so he mentioned something quite interesting here. He says Shui Chun, which is not well known outside of uh, people in the know what a Shui Chun is. So let's translate the name first of all, because it's hard to translate. A Shui means water. And Chun literally means dress, like a woman's dress. Yeah, like, Chunzi is a dress. A yeah, dress or a skirt. Or a skirt, yeah. So yeah. what he means here um, is a water skirt. Now, what a is water that? skirt. What is well, a water skirt? Yeah, so most of the people that practice uh, Shui Zhao today only think about the jacket. Yeah. They think, oh, this is a jacket wrestling and then you can wear whatever you want. Well, that's not actually the case. It was not actually the case back then. Uh, you had a certain attire that you were wearing, and one of the like the well, a piece of the outfit that you were wearing was the skirt. This skirt was called Shui Chun uh, in Chinese. Uh, I'm unfortunately not sure about the Manchu name uh, back then, but the Mongolian name also translates literally as skirt. So. Which is also, by the way, to spoiler alert, this skirt is also present in the, in the Mongolian wrestling so, attire. And it's in old Mongolian wrestling. Old Mongol Mongolian wrestling. And uh, what it is, it's basically a skirt that you wear around your waist. Uh, it can be under or it can be on top of your jacket. It depends on how you fix it. If you're wearing the Shui jacket, it's mostly under. And it's, it used to be pretty long. 
and what well, this is halfway down the thighs roughly yeah right? yeah it is and uh again when i was talking with this uh professor uh we were discussing this point too and back in the days they used to wear very very long skirts uh, they liked it long and they wore, were wearing... And this is uh, over the pants. Skirt. Over the pants, of course. Yeah. yeah, over the pants. You're not just wearing like the pants, but you're wearing like this skirt, skirt on top. Skirt over it, yeah. And well, the, the, the speculation is about the name because the Mongolian skirt is the mainly three colors. Blue, green and red. Um, and these colors have very specific meanings, like the blue symbol, like symbolizes the sky, the red mm. symbolizes the, the sun and the fire that the um, human is close to, and then the green, of course, the earth, the earth and the grassland. But why this mainly blue? This is uh, what I believe it's mostly because the area f where the Manchus were from, they were wearing mostly a blue skirt. Yeah. Mostly blue with other, either no other colors or the blue was predominant. Yeah. And we have like an example here of this. This is an old, uh, old skirt. This is... Uh, you would wear it this around your waist. And this is in the front. Yeah. yeah, this is in the front. You could see that the colors of this one are a little different because, well, the wrestler that gave me, so the professor said uh, back when he was wrestling, was wearing this, they could ch choose uh, sometimes the color and this was pretty popular, but normally is blue, green and red. Mm. And this is just like a, a Liwai, an exception. Yeah, and this is pretty nice because this is an old one. You can see from the material, yeah, yeah. and uh, it's like hand sewed. Yeah, uh, it's not like a commercial thing. And it's satin kind of material. It, 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 this one is satin. It's kind of yeah. like yeah, silkish. But normally they could be even longer. Yeah, and the top part being blue was always covering uh, way more. Yeah. And uh, what I believe was the case with the Manchus, because spoiler again, uh, different areas had different uh, way of either wearing or different kind of clothing for the wrestling. The, the jacket could be different, the shui chun could be different, the pants could be slightly different, the boots could be slightly different too. So I believe from the, the, way, the area that the Manchus were from was mostly blue. And it's not just like my belief, I'm not like pulling this it. out of my head. We see it in a few paintings. Uh, paintings that we can maybe. And that's of the shampoo yin. Yeah, it's not just random paintings. So, yeah. yeah, it's paintings depicting the shampoo yin in the period of the shampoo yin. Yeah. Not just like me right now painting them. Yeah. Okay, this is a historical painting uh, that we might take a look. So the Shui Chun was worn by the shampoo yin, and he says the early uh, Shui Jiao wrestlers as yes. well. When he says early, he means just after the fall of the Qing and the. And the Republican era, it was still being worn. No, uh, I think uh, it, it means mostly the early period in which the Qing Dynasty entered uh, Beijing. Ah, after right. the Republic, uh, after the fall of the Qing Dynasty, all the traditional cloth cl clothing was abandoned because that was tied to a very specific palace uh, context that was not present anymore when the wrestling moved out of the palace. Right, right. So Shui Chun, we have it in Mongolian. And we see it in the yeah. shampoo ying. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a connection. And that's why he's mentioning it. He's not mentioning it for, oh, by the way, they used to wear a skirt. He's yeah. trying to say, the Mongolians wore it. Exactly. The shampoo ying wore it too. Yeah, that's and not random. And he even refers to it. We have paintings that you can see it. Yeah, so in this picture, you can see this is actually of the shampoo ying from the, that period. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, you can clearly see the wrestling attire. Uh, mm. You can see that... The guys were wearing a white jacket. The white jacket is made out of cloth because we see these like lines, which was yeah, lines that were the stitching. Yeah, the stitching. And then you can clearly see the blue skirt. They were yeah, wearing a blue over their skirt. Pants. Yeah, over their pants under the jacket. And you could also see that they were wearing the what in call in Manchu is called takito, uh, which uh, were these like guards around your like They're knees. They're like chaps. Chaps, exactly. They call them Toho in, in Mongolia. Toho and in uh, Takito in, in Manchu, which is, again, another common point uh, between the two wrestling. I mean, we can call it a common point, but to me, they're just basically the same thing. It's just like when you it's wrestle, you, you need to wear shoes. Yeah. And but for them to wrestle, you need to wear that attire. That's and it's interesting because I just used the English word chaps. 
yeah. you know what chaps are they're yeah. used for horse riding exactly so. exactly like these this is like a part of the traditional military attire exactly okay yeah like you don't wear them because they're cool uh you wear them because these two ethnicities they were pat like they're like a long time on riding horse. horses on the horse they and conquered like, china on the horse yeah you, you need them and also they protect your legs if you're wrestling well first of all if you're in the army and you're wrestling you're wrestling like in the beginning uh of the early uh like conquest period so when uh Nohachi started the conquest in the north and uh, uh right in the beginning when the manchus entered uh the palace wrestling was still um, predominantly used to train the troops whether later on when the Manchus established in uh, in the palace it became more of uh, a different uh, a different activity it was used uh, to keep to maintain relationship with other uh, no, we'll talk about that yeah you know, we'll about, that. just because the what I wanted to say is that later on it changed and the Takitu were Part of the military attire. So if you're a military and need to, you need to wrestle, you don't like strip off all the clothes. You just put a, put the the, the, jacket. the jacket on and you wrestle. So it's it's pretty nice. And we can see the other picture, this one, and it's also pretty nice. Same period. And you can see the colors very clearly. You can blue, clearly blue, blue. see the colors. You can see the boots. You can see the takitu. So the chaps and the blue skirt. And the blue skirt. The blue. And skirt, this is the shampooing. This is shampoo yin, you, how, as you can read here this on top. This shampoo yin, yeah. Shampoo yin. And you could clearly see the official garments. And uh, the white, again, peculiar part is that they were wearing white jackets. Mm. Which is always the key part when describing the Manchu wrestling and the shampoo yin specifically, that they were wearing white mm. jackets. 技术技术水平呢你看我们这东西是来源于蒙古它发展在北京市里面经过很多代表经济建筑以后呢它把这个建筑在这里建立国家基础的它算不定哦我们现在看这个家的活那些家伙虽然估计打那些什么位置就从
um, everybody that was not from the the banners, the Manchu and the Mongol banners, were kicked out. Lived outside the wall. Yeah, lived outside the wall. It's like you could not enter. Okay, and all the areas inside the wall were divided between the banners. Banner groups. And the banner groups were not just random people. And wrestling developed exactly yeah. inside the city. It's interesting because we know, if you know anything about Beijing's geography and today's uh, transportation, if you see the first circular um, subway yeah. ring, I think it's line two. If you look at line two, that actually kind of follows where the old city wall was. Yeah, the, the old city was between uh, the, the first and the second ring. Yeah. And right out of the second ring was considered outer city. Where, and that's where it, all the Han were like uh, pushed out of the city. So everybody that was not Manchu, Mongol or, or uh, belonging to banners were like living around the city. Uh, which is also interesting because the key place for the developing of modern Shuaijiao, which is uh, Tianqiao. Tianqiao is exactly at the border of, exactly. the, of the second ring. Yeah. So it's at the very border of the inner city. Everything that was out, Shuaijiao developed right there in Now between. we're talking about Shuaijiao following the fall of the Qing. Exactly, 100%. So this after is... the Shampu Ying was no longer really the Shampu Ying. 100%. Yeah. There's no wrestling before that yeah. in between people. So what's interesting also is the term Hu Tong. Oh, is, yeah. If you talk about Beijing, you talk about Hu Tongs. And yeah. the Hu Tongs are the old traditional alleyways, communities. But if you look at the name Hu Tong, it's two characters. Mm -hmm. Hu is a name for non-Han people. Mm -hmm. It's and Tong means amongst. Uh, yeah, it also it's a loan word. Yeah, for, and the, that's the other that's the other uh, interesting part because of the loan part of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, a lot of people struggle to figure it out because it's something that like you it's know. It's a bit page, cryptic. It's yeah. a bit cryptic because you know Hu Tong is, is a difficult word and uh, like De uh, yeah. Like uh, it does not really mean much if you don't add some meaning, but uh, hutong comes from uh, the Mongol hutok, hutok. which means uh, dwell, yeah. like well. Well, it's and a... uh, it's based on the way they were structured. They were structured with like crosses, cross streets, and the crossing of the streets there was a well, well and yeah. that's how the houses developed. And why? Oh, then Beijing is really old. It's not but like for me the interesting part is. The original term means that, and it's quite clear. It doesn't, oh, have, yeah, a, it yeah. doesn't have ethnicity tied to it. The but then they, they loan yeah. the word, and then the character they decided to use oh, sure, yeah. distinctly means non-Han yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so not, it's quite it's quite telling. Actually. It's not a random characters yeah. like for Dehu. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Dehu is just random character. Now he mentioned something about in the section two about after the founding the Shampu Ying and bodyguards. Yeah. Imperial bodyguards yeah. are all from the Shampu Ying. Yes. Now we know that the imperial bodyguards were specific banners. Yeah. They weren't Han banners. Uh, they were not Han banners. So it's like uh, it's very it's like you know if you look at the historical records or the way the military was organized, you could not get as that close to the emperor just by, you know, being non Manchu or Mongolian. You to access certain like military positions, you need to belong to certain specific banners and have certain like even bloodlines. You cannot just randomly become uh, a bodyguard, like an imperial bodyguard. An imperial bodyguard, which was late now, is Shuvei. So it's a very specific military title that you can get. And it's not easy to get. And not everybody is like, not because you're like good yeah. or strong, you can get a title of Shuvei. Maybe because you're strong, you can, you know, enter the military examinations. But by the way, the military examinations at the times, Manchus and Mongols were not taking part in the military yeah. examination. They didn't need to take part in the military examinations because the Manchus were born into a banner, banner system. Banners, they were automatically, it's They're hereditary. Automatic inside the military. That's what they do. There's nothing else they do. That's also why with the time that the Qing dynasty, you know, staying more in Beijing and not having to practice military that much, fell you know, fell apart and like kind of like forgot or like, um, let's say, changed a few of their like traditions. So yeah, you could not, you 100% could not get close to the emperor if you're not like a um, Manchu monk. And we had, you had to. And we had three types of guards in general. Yeah. Uh, that were the one was like palace guards, etc. Yeah. So they would be security of uh, imperial areas, locations, buildings, etc. Um, then you had vanguards, vanguards which would yeah. 
escort an entourage, an imperial entourage, when it goes out of uh, the palace. Yeah. And then you had imperial bodyguards which would stand in the vicinity of the emperor yeah. and protect him directly. And there were different banners that were allowed. And the first two, you could have Mongol and Manchu banners. But the last one, Imperial Bodyguards, was only the yeah. upper three Manchu banners. Yeah, only the and upper three Manchu the banners. Yeah. And they were barehanded. Yeah, barehanded. That's the other interesting thing. So why they were chosen was not because wrestling can be armed opponents. That's no. not really what we're trying to say. No, here. no. But because you weren't going to get into the room where the emperor is with a weapon. So these guys had to be very skilled without their weapons yeah i mean you need to think about you know if you get a chance to you know meet up with the u.s president what is the chance that you can have a weapon on you yeah. zero yeah, yeah. Like, i mean there's no chance unless you you know i don't know like you put it inside your mouth and they don't see it and then you spit it and out you throw your shoe at him yeah you maybe throw your shoe at him <laughs> but like you're not gonna get close to the emperor with a weapon yeah. Which is this also tells us about, you know, the the legend of the foundation of the of the Shampu Ying. So again with this um this to me is a legend. Uh it's used to give more meaning to the foundation of the Shampu Ying, but this as a, as a military unit, the Champuyin follows certain, let's say, characteristics that were already present in the Mongolian uh, army organization before. Uh, so it's or even Manchu, but it's, so it's not a new thing. But it was established for a very specific reason, and the 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 the, the legend that you know gives more meaning to its establishment is the capturing of Alpai. Which Albai was a very important general uh, during the Kangxi. period, and he basically had the power of the emperor because Kangxi was really young, and uh, he was doing whatever he wanted. Um, and you know, Kangxi, let's say, what did he do? He uh, raised a certain amount of uh, kids with him. Uh, but by the way, Kangxi was famous to be a really good wrestler too. It's not mm -hmm. just a random dude. Um, and he raised them with him, uh, wrestling. So he raised them, this what they were called, haha ha shou. Uh, haha in Manchu means like young boys. So he raised them to become his bodyguards. And one day when Ao Bai was, you know, in the same room with Kangxi, uh, what did they do as what the teachers tell you? They strip off their clothes. This is very important because we're going to see this this uh, like act in a lot of pictures and in a lot of drawings they took off their clothes the cloak okay and they captured Albai. Albai was big strong and older and very skilled in fighting but of course if you're going to be closer you're not going to carry any weapon. No weapons. Plus, so he was disarmed at that point. Disarmed and you I mean and that's why you needed maybe multiple people because you know he was strong and uh, then these guys after they like successfully captured Albai became the first like people in the Champagne. So the Champagne was established um, in that moment. By that, yeah. By that period of although we have records saying that before the Shampu Ying, we already had the Shampu Chu. But this again, this is a legend that tells us something. And it's inter interesting to say because what it's always described in the in the legend of the capture of Albai is them stripping their cloak, doing this gesture, making the cloak fall, and they were wearing the the jacket under it, and they would like then uh, capture him and subdue him. It's interesting because in many pictures that we have of the Shampooing pictures and uh, paintings, we always have in the background. I can pull it up. In the background, people with the jacket open, with the cloak open like this, mm. and wearing the jodo, the, 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 the jacket, the jacket uh, under. The jacket has different names in, in Manchu, yeah. but the jacket under. So, it's an interesting connection, and we have in pictures, we have it in drawings, and in this legend, and in this legend. Uh. <laughs> Mm. 
从到从到五六年参加中式水球比赛了，嗯，人家大量级的、中量级的，现在可了不得了，属于多年来北京就是内地没有专业训练了，人家那哈儿啊，就是激情荷尔蒙，那大馆好大了，这一进馆全是练的，好几百人一块儿练。他也请马教练，他们给说说说说手法，说说去训练的，他们也把这个咱们的这个内地这个先进的训练训练手手段。嗯。So the first thing he said here is quite interesting. Is he he openly says that Shui Jiao comes from the Mongolians, and he says Zheng Ge. He means the whole damn thing. Yeah. The whole damn thing comes from the Mongolians, and he said very clearly. A lot of people don't like to admit this, yeah, a lot and this don't. is why I'm making this video because even after my series of videos, which was just presenting historical facts in a, from a logical perspective, yeah. I was getting hate, like like anger thrown yeah. at me. About it, and and it's interesting because I think it's more ethnic pride than anything else, or also a little bit of stylistic factionalism, which mm -hmm. is common in Chinese martial arts for some reason. Very common. So you know, it's either the greatest or it's you know, uh, anyway. So it's interesting that he said that. Yeah, it is very interesting, and uh, unfortunately, there's not much to debate about this. And like we have historical records saying, you know, when the Champagne again it was established, uh, uh, only Mongolians it, it, it first Manchu banners could uh, were allowed to participate, and then uh, because of the very low level compared to the Mongolians, they had to hire Mongolian teachers, Mongolian coaches. To, and we have that's in the historical record. Oh, this is called. This is like I'm not like inventing this. This is like we have historical records saying this guy and uh, the yeah, other guy, yeah. um, they were. Uh, brought in to teach the champion to you know because they were always losing because every time they had like a competition because what happened ho always or often is like they have Manchu Mongolians do kind of say so uh, no. competition against each other um, because of course you have the Manchus and the Mongols and when they have to meet up they have the wrestler compete the wrestlers compete and then the Manchus were always losing so they had to hire somebody to you know. To help, help them, them improve. yeah, help them improve because that's can't. also part of the reason why the shampooing existed. It's like you guys, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna wrestle. All you're gonna do only do that. Like I mean, I, I, be, uh, be careful. Like the shampooing, they were wrestlers, but they what they did was not just wrestling. Yeah, no, they had wrestlers other... shooting heavy bows or yeah. pulling heavy bows and horse, horse and camel riding. Yeah, they have a whole bunch that were dedicated to horse riding. Yes, so. exactly. So again, if these three things don't sound Familiar to you, horse riding, camel riding, wrestling and shooting. shooting. Oh, I think to somebody should like ring a bell. You um, should add one more thing to there. If you have the Manchu language included, you've got Fedora, which is I Fedora, yeah. Which was Chenlong writing clearly about this. It, Chenlong was also really concerned of the fact that the Manchus that were living in a palace were losing what he thought was uh, their identity. So he kind of like constructed this idea of Fedora. the old ways. The old ways, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's there's nothing to debate. Like uh, Manchus were losing, Mongolian uh, coaches were hired. Uh, the level improved and uh, and uh, technical level. Unfortunately, though, we have like records, you know, of like times of uh, matches that were like fixed, and fixed matches are not like uncommon today too. Yeah, no. Uh, so it, I'm not. This is not a joke. Uh, like, fixed matches uh, might, might sound weird, but like they're. The, the happening today too it's normal like it, you need to think about these things as uh very peculiar events it's not like you win like a medal okay here well in the case of the the manchu um the manchu mongol you know relationship you represent your whole group so and sometimes if you have to represent you know all the mongols in front of the emperor i mean you cannot Sometimes you cannot have the, the, the Manchu wrestler lose. All the time. All the time. So sometimes they were like giving uh, the Manchus uh, chances to win or just letting them win. Uh, but, but this is evident in Qianlong. There's a letter of him saying, I don't want to fucking this thing like happening. Qianlong was a very like prideful and very like 
uh, I would say straight arrow. Straight, yeah, straight yeah. arrow person. Like he did not like this kind of stuff. Instead, we have other records of to see Empress not enjoying wrestling because it took too long, and she was like bored. <laughs> but it's a different period. But uh, it's interesting to see yeah. uh, the difference. But yeah, it's it's clear. Mongolians and Manchus have a similar type of wrestling. Similar. I'm I'm being very political here. Yeah. Okay, to like you know make everybody happy but they had they wrestled and the Manchus learned the wrestling from the Mongolians. Well what's interesting is you'll always hear the argument no 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 the Shampuying and the Han Chinese had their wrestling from the Song Dynasty. Oh yeah. This... And it's the ancient way mm -hmm. and that was mixed with whatever they learned from uh, and you know the the Shampuying coming out of the uh, you know imperial side and mixing it with the Song stuff and that's what Shui Jiao is today. Yeah. Well, yeah. Again, uh, you can say whatever you want. Uh, when do you, when you say this kind of stuff, I can say that uh, I don't know. Your Christmas you, presents came yeah. from Santa Claus. Okay, people. Tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Santa's coming to town. Santa! Oh my God! Yeah, my Christmas present came from Santa Claus. So that UFA invented whatever he invented. Yeah. Invented Everything. ten times, yeah. ten, ten style. Yeah. Um, the thing is that. I can prove you what I'm saying. You cannot prove me what you're saying. Incredible, um, what, what is that saying? Uh, uh, incredible claims require incredible evidence. Yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah. <laughs> well, where's the evidence for the existence of a continuation of song style wrestling? Well, there probably was. Let's say, let's say yeah, there yeah. probably might have been, yeah. let's say. And uh, some authors and uh, authors that I also respect say it was present, just not in the areas where like we saw this type of wrestling. It was present mostly in the South uh folk at, at the folk level but at a certain, po a certain point this practice just disappeared and if you want to yeah. say this practice disappeared and then it just like mixed with modern day shui jiao well you have the right to say it but you need to prove it yeah. otherwise it remains you saying oh there's you're these things yeah you have fa invented i mean well it's not um, probable I mean, you know, the, the thing is, once an, a practice like that dies out, it doesn't come back. And if it, the people start practicing something that's related, it doesn't mean it's even close to what it used to be. Yeah. It's the same that happened in Greece with Pankration or Pankration. Uh, exactly. It's gone. And then you've got people saying, no, 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 we do punch, kick, strike, yeah. wrestle now. And it's the ancient Pankration. No, it really isn't. So something that I would like to say, because this is like we need to... Well, this, this, it, it took me a long time to have this... Uh, to have this information um, and maybe other people had it before me but I did not so something that also always like made me wonder was because you know uh, the Mongolian book does not allow like raps mm -hmm. L follow me carefully okay this is not easy maybe to me to explain it to you it's not easy okay so Mongolian book does not allow like raps or leg touches yeah and this was the case also for the shampooing it was not allowed to grab, grab the legs, legs. But we have very predominant like techniques, very evident techniques, where the hand, in today's Shui Jiao, today's where the Shui hand Jiao. can touch the legs. And how do we solve this problem? Because you say, you see, there's this kind of stuff and there's this like Bao Tui. We'll talk about it in a second moment. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you solve this problem? Well, I, I can solve it e easily now. Because uh, I, I asked uh, people that researched uh, Mongolian book, uh, in the Mongolian wrestling for a long time. And they told me, you know, in the 60s, when this like uh, Mongolian wrestling was um, reorganized, uh, certain techniques were forbidden. For example, mm -hmm. when you put the leg, block the, leg. block the leg, and then you pull, was it present? Yes. Uh, you cannot do it anymore. Another one, you have show show. You bend down, and with the other leg, you sweep uh, the, the other hand. foot. Yeah. The other foot, this foot, and you flip it. Of course, it's not a sweep. It's just Blocking. a block. Yeah. It's like a hit, and then you pull, and a few others that were touching the leg, that were present also in the Mongolian book, uh, were just forbidden. And I asked the professor again, like, well, wrestler, old wrestler didn't complain about it? Well, they did, uh, because, like, you lost techniques. And some of them maybe favored those techniques. Yeah, exactly. Well, you cannot do anything about it. They decided that way, and it's it became that way. But he confirmed those techniques. I mean, his brothers was re his brother was wrestling in that period, and he was a famous wrestler, the professor's brother. professor. And uh, yeah, they were using it. Uh, they were using shobia. They were using other techniques where you could touch the legs, touch the legs, and not grab the legs. Okay, and uh, now they're forbidden. 
So it makes sense now that you have techniques such as Shou Bie. Um, if you, if you want to go a little deeper, uh, what I always thought about is the fact that uh, Beijing Shui Jiao always emphasizes the use of Ji Ben Gong, which is very predominant. Ji Ben Gong, basic skill. Basic skill movement, yeah, the, like drills. Uh, drills. And you have what I believe that I, I believe that the Ji Ben Gong that we have right now, uh, most of them, if we actually are able to research, uh, tell a lot about the the original techniques that were present. Because of course, a lot of different techniques, you know, develop with time. But Shou Bie is one of them. Shou Hou is one of them. And I was like, well, this is, it's very weird that the later movement had uh, like uh, developed um, a Zibin Gong. Let's make an example, uh, Pi, Pi or La Chui, which is a recent movement. Uh, it's an evolution of Chui. Um, does not have, it has, it's a variation, it has a new Jiben Gong, or it has a Jiben Gong with like a tool. Oh. Uh, the original Jiben Gong is just uh, Tiao Bongzi, because it's just an evolution of a recent movement from Chui, okay? And then you just put the leg in between and you put, you do it in, on a single leg. Okay, but it's a recent movement. So I was figuring, hey, why, why, like you have Shou Bie, which has like very specific um, Tu Shou, so no, like free hands or like uh, tool, like uh, drills with like uh, tools. Why is this allowed if in the beginning was not? It's, it's clear because it, it was allowed. Yeah, so the rules because, were changed. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, back then, you could touch, you could touch the leg. Yeah, in, so in the you know that's the argument a lot of people make. They're like, oh, but you see the hand, the the hand stuff is not Mongolian. They're yeah. not allowed to. You no, know, but they were allowed. No, they, they were, they were allowed. And another thing, um, we need to we need to be very, uh, like when you talk about the evolution of Shui Jiao, you need to be aware that it's not, it does not exist in a vacuum. So when Shui Jiao developed a lot, uh, so of course, uh, Shui Jiao. Went, got out of the out champion. Of the it developed the, in the in, in the, the market public streets and yeah. public, uh, and a lot of people like to say that um, the leg grabs come from the manichu, which is what apparently is left uh, behind from the Song Dynasty wrestling. That's that kind of no jacket. No jacket, no nothing. Wrestling. Sometimes they call it manichu. In Shanxi, they call it uh, nao yang. Nao yang, yeah. And grabbing like grabbing sheep kind exactly of well we need to be very careful here because in the same period like Shui Jiao, first of all got the name Shui Jiao. Uh, uh also international wrestling so Guoji Shui Jiao Guoji Shui Jiao entered Jiao china yeah. so like freestyling greco and the reason the reason why they decided uh to add the name Zhongguo Shi was because there was no way back then because the name of the wrestling was already Shui Jiao, mm. which only means wrestling. wrestling. It was not Buku anymore. Yeah. Okay. But it was only Shui Jiao. But then international, so freestyling record arrived and they were also called Shui Jiao because Shui Jiao means wrestling. So what do you do? You add an adjective to the wrestling that you have. And in that period, it was Zhongguo. Okay. So it became Zhongguo Shui Jiao. Yeah. Um, and well, if you practiced, if you practiced uh, freestyle, uh, and you know a little bit of uh, leg grabs and both ways, single leg, double leg, I mean they're very, very similar to the ones that were present in Shui Jiao. And in that period, a lot of the coaches that were practicing Chinese wrestling were also practicing Greco or freestyle, or even boxing, or even boxing. You know, uh, so I mean, you kind of start. To understand what I'm saying. That they're absorbing things. Yeah, from exactly. Other. Like you're wrestling, you're learning from other people. It was not like the grabbing the legs was not allowed during the Shampooyin. When did they enter wrestling? Well, in that period. When the foreign like freestyle wrestling entered China. To me, does Nao Yang has leg grabs? hundred uh, percent. Does it have both way? hundred percent. There's a lot of difference. It might have developed even further. But to say well, then that inside is Song Dynasty. Well, if we agree that Nao Yang or Mani Chou for 100% come from Song Dynasty wrestling. Well, which we need the, evidence for we that. We need evidence, but by the well, way, it doesn't so, exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah. And this is very little thing written and this, you need to have a specific tradition. Well, you also need a continuation, which you don't have. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, 
I mean, you can say whatever you want, you want, but like, let's make an example. Oh, this movement, uh, like in martial, Chinese martial arts, people always do it. Oh, this movement looks the same in this style and that style. They therefore, might have like, they're, they're the therefore same. Therefore, that one came from the Chinese no, style. Oh, fuck. It's not that. <laughs> the punch is a punch, right? Yeah. A, well, like exactly, a single leg exactly. is a single leg. Exactly. I mean, you can all like wrestle somebody by grabbing the ears, you know. Well, it would be a very, very uh, short-lived career. Yeah, very short-lived. I think you can grab somebody's ear, but like, you know. Uh, I don't know, but it's very interesting because very like predominant figure of that time were also either practicing freestyle or Greco or let's say. Well, this is the thing that I want to say, and a lot of people think that the, the reason I made the series is because I hate Chinese Shui Jiao. That's not at all why I made that. I just want I'm a, I like martial arts history, and it was always something that irritated me how misrepresented it was. But we got to say and give credit where credit's due. During the Republican era onward, Chinese wrestling, the way it developed in China by those first generation people, second generation people, if they didn't do what they did, and a lot of them predominantly were Han or other ethnic groups as well, but if they didn't do what they would do, there would be no Shui Jiao today. So we need to give credit where credit is due. That's the first thing. So, yeah. The second thing is, as he said in the video, the level increased because the, the training became more pref, uh, professional. Yeah. And realistically, if you took top level wrestlers today and had them wrestling, professional, uh, wrestling with Shampoo Ying wrestler from back then, I think the top level wrestlers today would probably win. I, I don't think so. so. This is like a common pattern for a lot of sports. Yeah. We tend to idolize, uh, you know, the past and like, you know, create some legends because it's interesting. It makes it more... Uh, you know, fantastic to imagine that back in the days was this huge, like, uh, you know, mo wrestling monster that were beating everybody. Yeah, they were probably beating everybody back then, but the skill, it developed so much and the training developed so much right now. It's like saying, you know, somebody from the 1930s Olympics for from like wrestling could wrestle right now Bo Nickel. That's no, there's no way. Yeah. There's no way. There's like it's gonna be like Bo Nickel is gonna eat everybody in the past, like in the 30s. Like, yeah, yeah. This like makes no sense, and this is common for every sport. Uh, because, like like imagine you know football. You know, imagine right now a top like you know Manchester City playing against like a football team from the 1930s. It's not even a game. Yeah. Okay. So the the, the things develop, things things change. Of course, back in the day, back in the day, they were like top, top like just like those guys were like the best, the, the, the best, best guys. Then. Yeah. But then things develop. Something uh, I think it's important also to mention is the way that you know Shui Jiao entered the public, because m most people kind of struggle to figure it out. Uh, so we're saying the Trump wing was present inside inside court. Inside. You know, like the Neichang, the inner city. Okay, and you know this, the Shampoo Ying was dismantled a few years prior to the Qing fall already. Yeah, and these wrestlers were again bannersmen. The the only thing they were doing was being a military person and wrestling or pulling bows, and they didn't know what to do. Some of them they scattered around the city and they ended up in the markets, in the markets where the people were like doing exhibition and to gain some performances. money decided to perform the wrestling. Some of them decided to do it. Others, we have records saying they did not want to show the wrestling outside of court because that is something that is meant to the be imperial. seen the, yeah, by the emperor. So this is not what they want to do. And again, uh, something that I would like to point out, it is true, 100% we need to recognize that modern Shui Jiao has like, let's say, big evolution steps. Mongolian part, Shampuyin, okay, with learning, and then we have the beginning of folk practice of Tian, at Tianxiao, so yeah. with people practicing. Commoners. Commoners. Tianxiao was in a very specific area, outside, right outside the inner yeah. city. Yeah. So it was a fulcrum point for all the people uh, in the market. But again, the very people that practiced Shui Jiao at the very beginning, there were still not a lot of like Han, like uh, ethnicity people. There was a lot of Manchus still. There's a lot of Hui people that started practicing this in the Muslims, market, yeah. Chinese Muslims. And um, a lot of Han started later on, uh, more around the 50s, yeah, 60s. This is not to make it 
is like a, a racial thing because again no, it's a cultural thing if yeah, it's a cultural thing and if we want to recognize the history of Schweizer we need to recognize its evolution and from the beginning to the end and the end is like a lot of people put a lot of sweat and a lot of work into developing the Schweizer and we are really grateful to have it and you know a lot of great teachers and great athletes also were had there's just like a difference in uh, sometimes preferences and in, in activities sometimes depending on the culture. Well, Confucian culture is not really a sporting culture. This is 100% very important to understand. In China, or in, let's say right now, when we talk about Chinese culture, we tend to, you know, flatten out everything and say that, you know, China is a, a 4,000 years unbroken culture, which is kind of funny. <laughs> to me because it's just no way yeah, nothing no, is like that no. just no way uh, and and it's just like literally erasing everything that is not yeah. uh, the same that doesn't conform to the norm which is terrible um, but yeah uh, the Confucius culture which is the base of the base of the let's say the Han culture uh, does despise movement in the Yidong Buru Yijing. Yeah. Uh, just a movement, is, movement not, is not better than still stay, staying still doing what studying you know the the confucian ideal career was to study to become an official to be to become a junza a good person whether you know different culture for example herdsmen like the mongols the ideal man like like man uh, like person so like not female man was to become strong to be able to ride a horse to be able to tame cattle to be able to shoot shoot an arrow herding herding shooting, riding, herding shooting ha, ha, like riding and wrestling. and wrestling it's just like differences in cultures uh again to talk about the uh, chibangong yeah so talking about the both ways so grabbing the legs and i was saying you know how most of the old techniques always have Zipengong or some new techniques develop a, like a variation on the old Zipengong. Mm. There is no really a Zipengong for both way. Oh, it doesn't exist. No, it does not exist. And if you want to do it, you just go and grab the leg. Yeah, that's an interesting point because in more modern combatives like Jiu Jitsu, etc., we actually have drills for single double leg shooting. You, you have single double leg shooting because you do it in, with a partner. Yeah, but you also have individual drills. Oh, uh, you have individual drills. Yeah, we have individual drills for the same thing, right? Yeah, it's like it's not, not really stressed in Chinese wrestling. Yeah, you see. You just go and grab, you just yeah. go and grab. And then, of course, there's a, a bunch of different like leg grabs and like escapes, especially in no Yang, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's not really part of the curriculum yeah, in, yeah. The, in the Chinese wrestling. Well, it kind of gives away its age. I, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 但是人家这个千人来的 每天从小做衰，他教感好。所以呢，他现在在全国各地，现在尤其呃，在一年有五六次比赛。呃，有的呢，企业，嗯，或者宣宣传他的企业，我某某的这个公司把请他们参加比赛，呃，给我拿一
uh, will to do something. Uh, nobody for the most part. For yeah. the most part, yeah. yeah. You can be, you know, more, you know, you can be better at something than other people. But like we're talking about here about a group of people, not just about like a single character. We're talking about people that were born or, or are born in a cultural environment. First of all, that does not despise uh, like sport activity yeah, or any kind, of, any kind of physical activity. That does not tell you need to sit down and read and be a junza or because if you go and like become an athlete, it's bad. Yeah. Uh, this is like a culture that, you know, you're born in a grassland or like what well, depends on Manchu business. We're talking about Mongolians now. You, you, you're born in the grassland and you're born under like very specific like climate Environment, yeah, and environment, environment and lifestyle requirement lifestyle requirement you need to be strong you need to work with the cattle since you're a kid so an cattle, animal sheep you need to catch and tame wild horses yeah, but... you need to castrate them take them down shear them hold them down throw them get on them exactly tame them you know so yeah like i do believe that again well this is my my own opinion uh, but i do believe because the mean the names that we have in in the records this is interesting uh talking about the difference in the terminology this is a big topic that i don't want to touch i just want to partially touch on it in the mongolian terms and the manchu terms that we have describe very few movements yeah very few and one name can describe a ton, a thousand ton different, of movements yeah different different approaches different techniques which is kind of weird and it's weird but it's pretty normal if you know how to explain it but what i wanted to say is that all the Oldest techniques, I believe, are those that can be applied to an animal. For example, you can do a hip throw on a horse. Yeah, I've seen it do. I've also there's, seen it. There's like, um, there's videos. You can do the uh, hula. Uh, so like, uh, how does how does it the judo term? I don't know. Uh, Ochigari? No. Yeah, kind of like. Ochi is this way though. Uh, no, then yeah. I don't know the the yeah. outer one. Um, so well, Sotogari is the outside of two legs. I've seen them do that to horses yes, too. I mean, yeah. if you can apply a technique to a horse to, or to a cattle, it's probably what they were doing or what they did to tame it. You probably it's like not the gonna... movie Dodgeball. Have you seen the movie Dodgeball? I've, I've seen it. If you can dodge traffic, oh, you can dodge a ball. Exactly. That's, that's the idea. <laughs> if you can dodge traffic, you can dodge a ball. <laughs> So, you know, if, you, if you've grown up like doing that kind of stuff and you don't have, you know, the commodities of the city and when, you, when you're done doing your things to the sheep and the horses and you have your friend or your brother there and you want to have fun, what do you do? You wrestle. wrestle. That's what they were doing, yeah. So, so it's culture, lifestyle, and yeah. uh, that's where they develop this innate ability. Well, it's environment more than anything it's, it's else. It's culture, yeah, yeah. It's culture. Yeah, it's yeah. cultural predominance or importance of a certain specific uh, activity. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, so here's an interesting additional point that he said yes. that the Mongolians are outstanding. We've spoken about that from their environment and culture that makes them outstanding at that. So lifestyle, culture, all of those things. Um, that help them to become naturally, not naturally, but develop them into very good wrestlers on, in general. Yeah. And then he mentioned that there's two other, it's not the same with other ethnic groups, and he doesn't talk about wrestling in the Han, he talks about wrestling as an innate activity of the Xinjiang people mm -hmm. and of the Tibetans. And we know that they had their own wrestlings, and he talks about Cherishi, which is the, yeah. the, the Xinjiang type of jacketless wrestling. Yeah. And uh, Pekka, or whatever he calls it, I'm not too clear on the actual way it's pronouncing, whatever it is, which is a Tibetan. We know yeah. that the Tibetans used to wrestle, but they kind of stopped. Yeah, they kind of stopped. They've kind of lost it. But yeah, you know a little bit more about the Xinjiang stuff. Well, Xinjiang stuff is pretty interesting because, again, uh, again, Master Li Boru is not saying these things, like pulling these things out of the hat. Like, yeah. uh, there's specific uh, records for what he's saying. And um, he's saying there's two 
main type of wrestling during the Qing Dynasty. And by two main type, it doesn't mean that anywhere else in China there was, again, there was no wrestling. Mm. Okay? At court, during very specific events in which wrestling was shown, there were two main styles displayed. One style was the Inner Mongolia and Manchu common wrestling, so a jacket wrestling. Jacket wrestling. The yeah. second one is the one from Xinjiang. And when was this? Uh, when, this when did it hap when, start happening? When, when did it start happening? This happened with the Qianlong conquered, uh, conquest of Xinjiang. Mm. Which, the, by the way, the term, the name Xinjiang, talks <laughs> about, gives you an idea of when it was conquered. Xin means new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, by, by, from the Dunga, Dunga uh, Khanate, yeah. which is like. Uh, the West, the Tsongkhar Khanate is a Khanate from the Western Mongols. So again, yeah. we're talking about Mongols and the Mongol tribe. Um, and this type of wrestling is pretty interesting because it, we're talking about the 1750 here. And mm. um, it's completely different. Uh, it's, they're wearing, no, they're wearing nothing. They're like almost completely naked. They're wearing pants, uh, like big uh, short pants, almost like uh, underwear. Mm. And it's similar, it's a mix between uh, freestyle wrestling and uh, a belt wrestling because you can grab those pants and you win by pinning so it means that after you throw if the throw is partial on the shoulder or like on the hand you need to keep pushing and force the opponent to put the both the two like shoulders and head yeah flat, uh, flat on the on the ground and again now this is why was this type of wrestling present in, at court uh, or during these kind of events it's because these events were used to, of course, invite, you know, your... Uh, include. Like, include, of Yeah, course. it's to include those newly conquered... Uh, yeah, conquered places. Places in there. In, in there. these events. Yeah. Because it's a way, you know, to have a relationship with them, you know, to show them the, what you do is also important. And um, wrestling, again, in those events, doing hunts... Uh, or right. like, yeah, Mulan hunts uh, or other events in uh, uh, Yuming Yuan or in uh, in other provinces in North Hebei. Um, we're used to, you know, for what was the goal was to entertain relation, political relations with uh, the Mongols or other tribes. And in this case, with the people from the uh, Dzungar Khanate yeah. that was just conquered. And to include them meant to, you know, keep, to cer keep a certain balance between uh, the, the different areas. And there's like a very famous painting. Yeah, that by Lan Shunin. Lan Shunin, which is, yeah, uh, Giuseppe Castiglione, yeah. which is like, a, it's another Italian. Somebody from your yeah. neck of the woods. Yeah, another Italian that decided to give us one of the nicest representation of um, wrestling from the Qing Dynasty. And he saw it with his eyes. He saw it with his eyes and we can see in this representation, we can both see the Manchu and Mongols wrestling together, wearing white jackets and, white jackets, and then down on the, corner. On the yeah. corner, people sometimes like miss it. Miss it, they don't pay, pay attention, but there's other two people Almost naked, just wearing like uh, almost like big underwear, wrestling on the ground. Yeah, he's pinning him. Pinning, and this is exactly the representation of uh, Chelishi, which yeah. is the t that type of wrestling. Yeah, yeah. But what he also says here, which is interesting, is like even though they had that wrestling, which is a different system, uh, it isn't as developed and into today's times or continuation as the Mongolian wrestling and of course Shui Jiao is by extension. Yeah, it didn't, it, it, it's not as big, of or course. Or popular. Because, yeah, it's not as popular because it's, of course, this is really, the, the difference is, well, in the Mongolia is way big, yeah, way bigger. Yeah. In the Mongolia is huge. And the Xinjiang is not small, but it's practiced specifically in, that, in yeah, those areas. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, or areas of the Western Mongolia, too, in the Mongolia. And, uh, well, Shui Jiao and Bok went through a completely different path. Like, you, you have to imagine, like, you know, where these wrestling were geographically located. Like you have one in the west here in this area, in Xinjiang and western in Mongolia up here. And then the other two were on the rest, you know, the whole north in the Mongolia. And then you have the area around Beijing yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah, Dongbei. Yeah. So first of all, those were closer. And then they were like, they had a different like position in the palace yeah. and like uh, politically. So, yeah. of course, with time, they went through a different path. Yeah. But th these, th this, this style of wrestling is still practiced. And again, there's um, events where like, they invite wrestlers from like, a different region, even of Indo-Mongolia, to participate. Yeah, yeah.
，他早年间中就是中国数学就那母体，就是就是就是那、这个娱乐，就是娱乐项目。哎，他他也是娱乐项目，娱乐健身，娱娱乐健身。就所以呢，那那那个清清王朝没进没进关的时候，他就是蒙，他请的那个教师，以及那个侍卫。让蒙古那扑克手，啊，啊，他每个部队里头有教教学教的，就是蒙古，啊，他所以呢，就应当说，蒙古族这个摔跤呢，是咱中国式摔跤的母体。So yeah, this is this is pretty interesting. He reiterates this thing that like you know Chinese wrestling or modern day shuijiao comes from uh, Mongolian book, and uh, to him there's no doubt, and to and people. It's clear, and uh, to people that researched this, it's I mean, there's no debate about it. And the interesting thing is that he actually clearly says that prior to Nurhaci's conquest, exactly, he had already unified, and prior to the conquest, he already had employed Mongolians. You know, uh, yeah, he already like took like in Nurhaci's time, they were we're not we're not talking about Manchus yet. Yeah, uh, like depending on the period, of yeah. course, and then at a certain point, they were he gave the name. Of, uh, like uh, Manchus, and um, it, it's interesting because uh, the wrestling, the the role of wrestling before they entered uh, Beijing, so before the Qing conquered, and we were we were talking about it before, and after it kind of changed. Before, he, as he was saying, you know, he already had bodyguards. Those bodyguards, those like were Mongolian wrestlers at the beginning. Of course, the identity Manchu Mongolians was different back yeah. back yeah. in the yeah. back in that period, and. Um, the the reason of practicing wrestling during the in the pre-conquest period was to keep you know the troop fit, you know it was like a military activity. Yeah. Whether well, then when he entered the city and the and the banners like stationed there like were stationed there like they they were not moving they were not going anywhere. There's some other banners that were going around, but most of them were like staying in the city. The mood the the mood and the reason to wrestle was different. That they later had to, you know, wrestle to keep relationship with other clans. Yeah, so it was used clans. for, for and, political terms. Yeah, as well. and it became more of like a political, yeah, yeah. meaning. Well, actually, so, that was what the Nadam was used for too by exactly. Chinggis. And what's interesting too is like, and we discussed this before we even started filming, was about the ge geography of where the Manchus come from in relation or comparison to the grasslands. Yeah. The Manchus come from forested areas. Yeah. So they won't have that experience that the Mongols develop by herding and raising animals, which gives them a lot of their yeah. wrestling ability. But they were superior hunters. Yeah, like uh, the way the Manchus could move, you know, formations. the formation, which is, of course, like the, ty the style of formation comes from the like a Mongolian style formation, yeah. but they developed it into a banner. They developed the needle in a, into a banner. And uh, the way they were moving the troops, uh, the way they were like superior at riding and shooting tactics, with the bow, yeah. tactics, it was different because they were hunters. What yeah, they did yeah. was like, you know, in the forest, you know, shooting at things. And sh shooting at things with big ass bows, yeah. like really big and really heavy bows. Again, we have like, historical documents saying that, you know, a bow, like a Qing bow at that time, first of all, it was very heavy to pull. So it had a lot of strength. Plus, the arrows were like huge. Yeah, they were like very little spears. Th spears, thick, long. And if you get like shot with one of that, it's like they have records of like people saying that one of those arrows could impale two people at a time. Yeah. It's just like, and imagine like a, like a bunch of, of like... Uh, People on a horse with like bows running at you and pointing to your head, or probably not to your head, but pointing to, you know, targets in between your um, your armor. That's the scary. But again, they did not have the same experience with the candles, which where is like animals, yeah. with where the wrestling part comes from. from yeah. the well, no, the reason why I raised it was because the imperial hunt, which was more of a political. Thing, why they included people like Xinjiang and they deliberately included the Mongol princes yeah. and why wrestlers were going there 
was because one, it was to make unity as a political thing, but also to show superiority 100%. as a military group. 100%. And you, the hunting part is where they showed that. Imagine being like, you know, uh, a Mongolian prince and you're invited to hunt with your with your guardsmen or your troops. And you see like this man just moving like ban mm. banners of like hundreds of people. In perfect Perfect coordination. formation, yeah. shooting and like hunting animals, like tigers and stuff. And then at night, of course, after this you know, display of soft power, which back then was not really soft, but like, you know, it's, yeah. that's, that's what it was. You know, I'm showing you, look at my military prowess. Look what I can do. Like, yeah. you're with me. Know your place. You, you, yeah, you, you better, you know, yeah. keep calm. But then when they had to wrestle at night, you know, they drink and, and wrestle, and then the Mongolians, like, come and smash, <laughs> come and smash people. <laughs> so they're like, okay, we need to learn that too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, because otherwise, <laughs> yeah, no face. And so, uh, yeah. so um that's that's really what it came uh down to yeah. all right so that was this interesting very short video but we stopped and we discussed many little aspects as we went through i think it's been quite interesting and enlightening there's a lot more to talk about there's a the ton but uh, we'll leave it at that and what i'll do is when this video when we're done here now i'll let lee baru's uh little piece play in full without us interrupting so you can watch it one more time yes thank you Thank you, thank you for inviting me. It was uh, it was a pleasure, and then finally, you know, finally getting back to the city and starting, you know, to do some things together. Hopefully, like, yeah, we'll uh, do many more. more. We'll do yeah, more about wrestling. Cool. All right. See you next time. See you next time. Have a good one. Then 尤其是水屯老年间那个咱北京的前清楚啊说交易穿水屯我们看现在那个工业化那那个挺典型的跟蒙古交那一样那跟一样也穿那么高靴子他们的技术技术水平呢应当我们这东西是来源于蒙古他
，嗯，呃，内地这个先进的训练训练体的手段，嗯，也吸收。但是人家这个天生来的，你比如说，他十几岁，俩孩子放放羊，啊，在那碰一个就就摔。啊，他有这条件，也不用辫子，也不用胶衣，嗯，条件比较好。另外，他就素质，大部分都有点那个，就跟我这形式的，有这个有劲啊。这个摔的，每天从小就摔，他脚感好、啊，所以呢，他现在在全国各地，现在尤其呃一这一年有。五六次比赛，嗯，哎，有的那企业，嗯，为了宣宣传他这企业和某某的汽车公司，啊，请他们参加比赛，呃，给我拿一冠军，拿几个，拿成绩，啊，我也这我这企业也也也沾光，说在某种程度上起到宣传作用，起到广告作用，啊，所以呢，在蒙古，这个摔跤的确是，也不是所有的少数民族不成，也不是也不是所有的少数民族都成。啊，你比如说蒙古，一花独秀，但是新疆，它有本民族的切体系，也有摔跤，但是它那形式呢，跟咱们这形式不太两个体系了，两个体系了啊,啊。还有呢，这个藏族，它也，它这也藏族北嘎，啊，藏族北嘎，它的摔跤，它也也属于娱乐形式的啊。它早年在中，就是中国的摔跤的母体，就是就是。娱乐项目，哎，他他也是娱乐项目，娱乐健身，娱娱乐健身，所、嗯、所以呢，这这这个清清王朝没进没进关的时候，他就是蒙，他请的那个教师，嗯，以及那个侍卫，都在蒙蒙古，让蒙古的跑跑跑，啊，他每个部队里头有教教摔跤的，就是蒙古，啊，他所以呢，就应当说。摔跤呢，是咱们中国式摔跤的母体。